everyone. The Fountain of Faith, uh, Baptist Church welcomes our family and friends and our visitors. And would our, I would like to uh, say that some of our visitors this morning are part of my family, yeah. my yeah. grandkids. <laughs> and my All right, so we pray and we hope that something is said during our message and during service that will be spiritually inspiring to you. Thank you for your presence, and we look forward to seeing you again. All right, we're located at 14513 South Post Oak Road, Houston, Texas, 77045. On the campus of Holy Trinity Missionary Baptist Church. Please visit us on our website, www.folbchouston.org. You may also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube. Twitter is now X, formerly known as Twitter. Our pastor teacher is Reverend Mark A. Kane. The following are our Fountain of Faith Baptist Church announcements for the month of June. Prayer meeting and Bible study are held on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, Bible study 7.30. On June 19th, no Bible study will be held. Sunday school is held at 10.30 each Sunday at the Trinity, Holy Trinity Missionary Baptist Church Multipurpose Building. 12 o'clock noon, worship service is held at the Holy Trinity Missionary Baptist Church Sanctuary. June 30th, no Sunday school will be held. There will be a joint service with Holy Trinity at 9.30 a.m. Our Fountain of Faith Baptist Church 22nd anniversary will be held Sunday, July 21st at uh, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Our guest speaker, Reverend Richard Scott, pastor of Family Unity Baptist Church, Lamarck, Texas. Our anniversary pledge is $322. Thank you, FOFBC members and friends, for any amount that you are comfortable in giving. And this was from our FOFBC elders and leadership. Our colors this year are burgundy, green, and white. Sunday school books are available. Please see Deacon Joseph Simmons. Men's Fellowship will be, have, will be held Saturday, June 22nd, 2024, 9 a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. at Ridgeview Park, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Marriage Ministry Conference there will be a conference Friday and Saturday, June 28th through 29th at Bethel's Place Empowerment Center. That address is 12660 Sandpiper Drive, Houston, Texas, 77035. The cost is $100 per couple. Our pastor's sister, Pamela Faye Kane Johnson, Celebration of Life, will be held Saturday, June 8th, 2020 at 1 o'clock p.m. where the location will be held is Lake, Lakewood Church Chapel, 3700 Southwest Freeway, Houston, Texas, 77037. This is also online in our email that we send to all members as well as on our website, so you can go and get all the information on our website. Now, this is hosted by the Johnson family, and they would like for you to join them and share your favorite memories of Pamela Faye. The celebration again starts at Lakewood Church Chapel, one o'clock, immediately followed by a repast next door at the Double Tree Greenway. You must RSVP to attend the repast. There will be shuttles to the hotel. Uh, 
If you have any questions, you may contact the family, and that information is also provided for you via email as well as our website. And the secretarial staff also uh, text to all members information to assist with uh, attending. So if you have any questions regarding that, please uh, contact the secretarial staff here at FOF, FOFBC. We have a thank you card from Sister Louise Stacy, uh, the secretary for Liberty Baptist Church. Our church did send her a uh, donation when her sister passed, and she sent a card saying that she thanks us for the prayers, the monetary support, and love that we showed her during the passing of her sister. And as most of you, most of you know her, and she is always dutiful in assisting Fountain of Faith Baptist Church with any needs that we have for events and services connected with Liberty Baptist, as well as for ours, our services. Today's spiritual food for thought. Renew my nature today, dear Jesus, as I yield to become more like you. Our message today, the walk of wisdom, taken from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. At this time, I present to you our very own pastor teacher, Reverend Mark A. Kane. Thank you very much. We thank God for your presence here today, and we thank God that he is always present. Uh, as I said before, we had a wonderful uh, Sunday school lesson this morning, and our 11 o'clock, our, our 12 o'clock lesson segues right into that as well. There's so much going on in our world today, and you've often heard me say that we're living during a time when common sense should be listed as a superpower. Yeah. Well, our lesson speaks to that today, and our lesson for the day, and please repeat after me, the walk of, the walk of wisdom. wisdom. The walk of wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom uh, missing today. You've heard it before. The tragedy is, is that we get old too soon and wise too late. We get old too soon and wise too late. Well, you know, God has a remedy for that. If we want to find ourselves uh, uh, in step with him and making sure that we're making wise decisions, making good decisions from a position of strength, God has left us his word. Right, if you're turning your Bibles today, we'll be in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, just looking at three verses today, but three powerful and profound verses. And what you will find as you make your way to the fifth chapter, uh, God has given us some simple instructions, but they are instructions that need to be understood and followed, not just received and put aside. And uh, for your hearing, let me just read those three uh, from the New American Standard. That's Ephesians 5, 4, 15 through 17. It says, therefore, it reads a little bit different in the King James Bible. It says, see then, but therefore, be careful how you walk, uh, not as unwise men, but as wise. And the King James says, not as fools. Uh, be careful that you walk circumspectly. But verse 16, it says, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. And find in verse uh, 17 it says, So then do not be foolish or unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And we've been told time and time through Scripture, in all you're getting, get understanding. It's one thing to be here and hear God's word, but if you don't understand it, you don't benefit from it. We're no better off than the unbeliever. But you'll find out as we make our way to Ephesians 5, and before we get to verse 15, uh, beginning in this particular book, chapter 4, the very first verse, all the way down to chapter 5, verse 14. The Apostle Paul uh, had challenged the church, church in Ephesians, concerning her walk before the Lord in regards to several things, in regards to the church's humility, the church's unity, uh, the church's separation from the world and not being caught up by the culture. Uh, he challenged them regarding their walk in, in the love and the light of the Lord in the love and the light of the Lord. Now, uh, we are challenged uh, today in our study uh, to add to those virtues the walk of wisdom. We are challenged today to add to those virtues the walk of wisdom. I, I like how Martin Luther King put it. He said, in order to expel a lower vice, 
you must concentrate on the high virtue. The highest virtue in the world is God's word uh, that is circling through the stream of our consciousness as we put it uh, to practice in our lives. So uh, this, this word wisdom is important here. The word wisdom in our, in our language, the American language, it means knowledge of what is true or right coupled with just judgment as to action. That's what you saw last week in New York. They finally gave a just judgment. Uh, but in scripture, it carries the idea of understanding the will of God as it is revealed through his word. You see, you can't be obedient to God's will if you don't understand it from his word. And so uh, Paul is trying to make it abundantly clear here what God requires. And when you understand his will, God says, I want you to live that out in your daily living, in your life, in your practice, in your behavior. Uh, so the call here for us today is for believers to yield, to surrender uh, to the word of God in our daily walk. That word walk means your daily behavior. And if you want to be taken seriously as a person, you have to be consistent. We can say we're Christians all we want. We can say the whole cliches, I'm blessed and highly favored, too anointed to be disappointed, all those things. But unless it is, unless your, your, your video matches your audio, mm -hmm. those children sitting there, they're going to say, I, I, don't, I don't believe what you're saying. You told me one thing, but you did something else. But I'm going to keep it to myself because I can't do nothing about it. But I'm probably going to follow your pattern. I'm probably, probably going to follow your pattern. That's why it says in Acts 16.31, it says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. And the word household means they may they will follow your pattern if you have a right relationship with the Lord. If you don't and you're walking uh, like you don't know the Lord, that's the pattern they're going to follow. So it's important that we understand that our walk is important. So in this passage, Paul gives us some, some insights into the walk of wisdom uh, and what it's supposed to look like. And as we look into these insights, God is also showing us how to activate that walk. Uh, too, too many of us got to hitch and our get along. Too many of us got a hitch in our gallery. We think we're cool, but look like we got a broke leg. You know, God don't know, don't don't know, don't don't need any more Christians trying to do the stanky leg. He wants you to walk erect. He wants you to walk right. Okay, and this is what God is trying to make clear to us. If you got a walk, a right walk, it'll be a diligent walk. Look at your hand out there. It'll be a discerning walk, and it will be a definite walk. That's how we can walk with confidence. That's how we can walk in victory. So let's get caught up here. In our first outline, we look at Ephesians 5 and 15. Ephesians 5 and 15 is trying to show us how uh, to have a diligent walk and what it means to be diligent on our walk. A lot of people even say they have faith. Uh, but God says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them who diligently seek him. Not haphazardly seek him. Not every now and then seek him. Not give God what's left and not what's right. And so we're going to see what God requires as we uh, look into uh, verse 15, reading from the New American Standard, and making it clear to you as you may be reading it from the King James. It says, therefore, be careful, or see then, uh, circumspectively, uh, be, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, or not as uh, fools, but as wise, is what God is telling us here. As we venture into this First verse. It's important to see what God requires of us. Uh, uh, the, the wise walk is clearly defined in this very first verse here. Uh, Paul calls upon the church as it says, See then that ye walk circumspectly. And, and the word see is important. It comes from a Greek word blepo, B-L-E-P-O, blepo. And it means to observe. In other words, Paul is saying, now observe your, your behavior, your character. Observe. Uh, 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 Paul is saying, be mindful of, of something or beware that you do something, not every now and then, but every day. Beware that you walk this way every day is what Paul is saying. We used to have an old song and back in the old church it says, always let the good shine through because somebody's always watching you. So he says, be careful that you do this every day, uh, which is to, first of all, take in God's word and then apply it to your life. We were talking about just this morning about uh, uh, in Sunday school about influencers. Well, you know, God expects every believer to be an influencer. You ought to influence people with your walk. You know, you know, growing up, it was some people that we would look at, we were young people, said, man, this show walk cool. Man, he looked like he got the world on top of his show. Well, God wants people to see that about your behavior in your daily living, that people see that you're content, 
uh, people see that you're confident. And you're living out the principle that the more confidence you have in God, the more courage you have toward men and circumstances. That you walk like a person that have a, has a personal sense of destiny. What are you talking about, Pastor? You know, in, in, in your daily living, you show poise. You show flexibility. Uh, you show a professionalism. You're, 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 you're able to love people even if they don't love you back. God is saying here. And God is saying that uh, you, when people see you, they, they know it's something, an air about you, that you've got a personal sense of destiny. And uh, you just point them right back to Ephesians 2.10. I'm God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. You can be a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. But first you have to be obedient to God's will and God's way. So, so it also means that you do something every day which is to take in God's word and, and that you be influenced by his word and not by false truth that you get on a daily basis. You know, we didn't know anything about fake this or fake that until we had a fake president that just got convicted of 34 felony counts. God says you go to the truth. And you apply the truth. Don't worry about what somebody says, not real or real. What does my word say? And so this is what it means in order to, uh, to walk in wisdom. Now that word walk, you see there in the 15th verse, comes from another Greek word uh, pronounced parapateo. Parapateo. P-A-R-I-P-A-T-E-O. Which means more than walking. <laughs> but to advance and to move forward toward the objective of spiritual growth and production. It means you're always moving forward. Yeah, you're going to get knocked down every now and then, but get back up and keep moving forward. Even when you fall, make sure you fall forward, is what God is saying here. So he's, he's concerned about our walk, our everyday living, or if you have the King James Bible, the word circumspectly. Circumspectly, uh, it carries the idea of being diligent, being accurate, and being precise. Being diligent, being accurate, and being precise. I said, what you talking about, preacher? God gives us two things to live by. He gives us limited time on this earth and a standard to live by. We are without excuse if we don't make the most of both of those. That's what God is telling us here, and you'll see that in your head down on the doctrine of one day at a time as we get to that a little bit later. But, but Paul is trying to make it abundantly clear. God has given us command, and he expects us to obey his command. So the command is for us to give attention to the way we walk in this world. Don't worry about what's happening to the right or to the left or what the unbelievers are doing or the baby Christians are doing or the adolescent Christians are doing. If you are growing as a believer in Jesus Christ, be concerned about the race that God has put you in and to continue to move forward and be obedient and be a good witness uh, to God's word. So we, we have been made alive in Jesus Christ. So, so they stumbled, those that didn't follow God's word, it says don't walk not as fools, is what God says here. Now Paul gives a negative. See, the first part of that was a positive challenge. Now we get to the negative challenge. It says, now walk in such a way that you're wise and not as fools, it says here, or unwise in the New American Standard. This negative challenge has a purpose. Uh, we can become fools anytime we reject sound doctrine. We become fools anytime we reject sound doctrine. In other words, fools mean that simply you, you reject what God has said and you want to do what you want to do. And I love how Nelson Mandela put it. He says, uh, when, when wise men are silent, fools multiply. When wise men are silent, fools multiply. And we know what happened in South Africa. And isn't it amazing that it's happening here in, in America now today? Fools multiply. And still we got a man that was convicted of 34 federal counts, and he's the number one candidate for the Republican Party. Fools multiply. But you hold on to God's truth. Uh, God has called us out for such a time as this. Uh, we're not to walk like the world around us. Uh, you know, these, these unwise people, these people that become fools for rejecting God's word, they stumble in the darkness of their depraved condition. And they take no heed to where their next foot will fall. You know, be careful. You say pride go it, but what? Pride go it before the fall. Pride go it before the fall. And so God wants us to be aware that uh, when we're taking a step, because when you get ready to walk, when you raise one of those foot, you, you off of balance then, you're off balance. So that means you gotta concentrate on the next step. God says, I want you to stay focused on my word at all times. We have been given what? The spirit of God to make sure we make the correct, right step. So we have been given the light of God's word so that we don't stumble 
around in life like a blind man. But we have been equipped to walk accurately, to walk placing each step precisely where it pleases the Lord and it leads us closer to him. That's why David put in Psalm 119 verse 105, uh, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. You see, we don't have to walk in darkness. It's, it, we understand when a child is afraid of the dark. But it's amazing uh, when an adult is afraid of the light. Isn't that amazing? This is the times in which we live. We live trying to live up, right side up in a world that's upside down. But God still expects us to be light in the midst of all of this darkness. So the, the walk has to be diligent. It has to be consistent. We can't be an every now and then Christian. We can't be Christians on Sundays and a practical atheist uh, Monday through Saturday. Our walk has to be consistent. This is a walk of wisdom. This is a walk that will bless this generation and the next. And if we don't walk the right way, then we lead people astray. We move down to our second outline. It says now, what does this walk of wisdom look like? It is a discerning walk. For some people, th people think that discernment just automatically comes to the Christian. No, discernment is a skill. You, you, you have to develop this particular spiritual skill. And it comes from consistently taking in God's word and applying it in your life. And God expects us, as we take in his word and apply it, uh, we can utilize this uh, day by day, one day at a time. We ought to walk accurately, literally, perfectly in this world. But we are also to walk with discernment. So there again, uh, why is this important? Because this is the only way you can do what verse 16 says, making the most of your time because the days are evil. We're going to find out right away. You know the time that God has given us? Some of us just burn that time and it, it turns into nothing. See, when we go to get our great evaluation, when they're catching hell down here, doing the tribulation for seven years, and we're being evaluated in heaven, uh, right after the rapture, God is going to show you all the time he gave you. He said, look, I gave you 80 years, and you only gave me a week in fellowship. He said, what, 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 what kind of trade-off is that? He said, let me show you all these things you, you thought you can get credit for. That's one big bonfire. Stand right there and watch it burn. Watch it burn. I have no rewards for you. You just be glad to be in heaven. Get your happy-go-lucky. I'm sorry. It says right here. <laughs> it says right here. It's God's way or uh, no way at all. It's God's way or <laughs> no way at all. <laughs> so the Lord here says that we are to redeem the time. I don't like that word redeem. Redeeming comes from another Greek word, agorazo, A-G-O-R-A-Z-O, agorazo. It means to buy up. It means to deliver from loss. God wants you to save your time. This time he's giving you so you can give it back to him. You see? And if you, only what you do for Christ will last. That's the summary of what I'm saying. Only what you do for Christ will last. Everything you do out of fellowship, that's wood and stubble that's burned up. It's no good. It's amazing how God can give you 70, 80 years and then all you got to show to him is a week. It's a week to give back to him. That's a bad investment. But God is good. Here, when we look at this word redeem, it is used, it was used back in that culture of purchasing a slave in order to set him free. See, that's what God did for us. We're all born into the slave market of sin. We're all born in sin because when Adam sinned, that sin is passed down through the rest of the generations of humanity. That's what it says in Romans 5.12. When Adam sinned, all sin and death, spiritual death, passed amongst all, all generations. And God is telling us here, uh, you, you, you're born in the slave market of sin and you're headed straight to hell unless you accept the gift of my son. So the word redeeming is very important as God buys us uh, from hell to set us free by going to the cross to die for our sins. That's what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper today. So. It was used in that culture for purchasing a slave in order to set him free. Now look at that word time is important. Because many of us think we have more time than we actually do. I want you to ponder and think for just a moment. Whatever age you are right now, everyone that's here, there's somebody that has died at that age. Somebody has died at the age you are right now. You and I don't have to be here. God allowed us to be here. We didn't merit to be here. Salvation is not a, a, a reward for the righteous. It's a gift to the guilty. God has been gracious to us all. Now God is saying, after I shared that with you, what are you going to do with the rest of your time? How are you going to spend the rest of that time? How are you going to use that for me? Great food for thought, isn't it? So that's what he means by redeeming the time. The word time, uh, it doesn't really, <clears throat> it does not speak about the, the measure like we look at it on the clock going round and round. 
It doesn't speak of minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years. The word he uses here is a word that speaks of a measured allotment of time. All of us in here, God already knows how much time we have. You don't know, he knows. God is saying, how are you using that measured allotment of time that I gave you? Amen. Don't compare yourself to someone else. They got different time. You know, as a matter of fact, you may look at some people out here and say, oh, he, he look kind of old. Well, maybe God going to give me another 20 years. And you can be 15 and all you got left is two. So who really is old in here? All right. Who really is old in here? All you got is today. That's why the Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He only gives us one day at a time. That's why you have that doctrine on your handout. All you get is one day at a time. God doesn't promise you tomorrow. He promises you right now. So God says, be careful as you see on your hand. Now, don't waste your life. Don't waste the time that God has so graciously given us. For Paul is talking about uh, the small window of time we have in this world. In other words, we are to deliver the allotted time we have been given in this world from loss. We are to deliver it from loss. Uh, we, we, we risk wasting the time that God has given us. So the phrase speaks about our walk uh, with the Lord on this earth. It challenges us to make good use of every opportunity for serving the Lord. Make good use of every opportunity to serve the Lord. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 1.17. Peter says this, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. So, so he said, and I said, now, now, you want to give to the Father good works. Not human good, but divine good. You and I have been given a short window of time to live in this world. At best, our lives, as James says, is but a vapor. You see it there, and then it's gone. Puff of smoke. Uh, we are just here for a few days, Job said. Man is born for a few days, and then a whole lot of trouble. Uh, we need to make the most of every opportunity that we're given to serve God. So we need to do what? Take time to pray. Take time to worship. Take time to share the gospel. Take time to read your Bible. Take time to honor the Lord every minute of every day. Because your life is like this. It is moment by moment. It's not week by week. Don't be deceived. The greatest lie Satan has ever told anybody is that, oh, you got more time. You got more time. Don't worry about going and doing that church thing. You got time for that. You got time to get right with God. No, all you got is right now and the seconds that are involved. So, so God is saying, be careful how you hear. Because what? He goes on to say in that verse, because the days are evil. Underline that. Paul tells us that we should salvage the time we have been given because the days are evil. And the word evil comes from the same word that we get our word, listen up, pornographic. I said the word evil comes from the same word as our word pornographic. He's saying the days are wicked, the days are evil, and filled with every kind of sin uh, and every kind of vice that is known to man. God has placed us here to be light to a world trapped in darkness. <laughs> Maybe that's why they call them trap houses. We're trapped in darkness. God says, you ought to be ambassadors for me, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, reaching out to others as if Christ himself were reaching out to them. So uh, a good translation would be this. Uh, constantly buying the time assigned to you because the days in your assignment are evil. Great food for thought, isn't it? Get to our last outline. Our last outline tells us about this walk of wisdom. It is a definite walk. It's a definite walk. It's a walk whereby you're confident and the world knows it. And so we finally see in verse 17 it says, so, so then do not be foolish, or King James would say unwise, uh, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Why does he say that? Because you can come to church and still miss God. You can be in the right place and don't benefit from it. You know, you can be a believer that's a spiritual billionaire living like a pauper. Like somebody is living under a bridge because you're not willing to apply the wisdom that God has made available through his word. And so finally Paul says, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so that word unwise, unline that word. It means, <laughs> not me, here's what the Bible says, it means to be stupid or ignorant. To be stupid or ignorant. 
This is a passage that caught my attention early on in my ministry when I began to study God's word. God said, I don't want to be found in that. It refers to a person who thinks uh, of him, he thinks himself, he thinks of himself as being wise or listen, or as a stable genius. Anybody hear anybody ever said that before? Thought they was man, woman, cow, TV. Y'all remember anybody that said that before? That's the guy that got uh, charged with 34 federal counts. He called himself a stable genius. Said he had a psychological test. And he could remember elephant, man, woman. <laughs> what? What? And these are the people that they're holding up. We live during a time when common sense should be listed as a superpower. Put a cape on and put on that common sense, man, and just fly. Every day, tell people you're, you're a spiritual hero. It's ridiculous the time in which we're living. So, that word unwise means to be stupid or ignorant. It refers to a person who thinks he's all that in a bag of chips and he actually knows nothing. If, if, if you take this verse in connection with the two uh, that preceded it, uh, Paul is saying this, don't run through this world like an idiot. That's the breakdown of it. Paul says, don't you run through this world like an idiot. You know, like the king who has no clothes on and everybody telling you you look great. Do not be deceived. You're only deceived if you want to be. If we are not careful, we will fall into the trap of being too busy for God. We're busy for everything but for what God requires. That's how we can live unwise in this world. We will allow the enemy to, to so fill our calendar with things we think are good that we wind up running frantically through, through life with all these activities we put on our calendar, but we have no time for God. He's not a priority in our lives. We may throw him in every now and then. Well, <laughs> be careful how you're here. Be ye not unwise. God did not create us or to save us to live like we want to live. No, it's not your thing. You can't do what you want to do. God owns you. God owns you. You are his temple. Uh, God says he didn't call us to be self-centered. He called us to be God-centered. So instead of foolishly running through life without a care in the world for God's plan, we are counsel to what? Be understanding. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Be ye not unwise, but un understand what the will of the Lord is. You know the word unwise in, in, in the Hebrew is called aphron. It means to be stupid and evil. Those are the worst kind of people in the world. A person that is evil and stupid. Some of y'all have had them. You've had supervisors like this. Somebody been promoted higher than they should go. You know, you've seen people like that before. You're like, oh, Lord, what are they doing? <laughs> you know, or, you know, like we had a guy that was president one time. He said, you know, what? You just talking to the medical director. You just take some bleach, right? And just, you just kind of infuse it there. Could you, could you? Oh, Lord, help us, please. <laughs> Be careful how you hear. But that's what happens when you try to tell people to go to 2 Corinthians <laughs> instead of 2 Corinthians. <laughs> you need to know the Bible for yourself. You need to know the Bible for yourself. So instead of foolishly running around like we don't know God, we ought to be his ambassadors. We ought to be his priests. We ought to be his ministers. Uh, the word of God reveals the will of God. We have to slow down long enough to read the word of God, to meditate on it, and so that we can understand it. We must take the time for the Bible. We, we use that acronym for the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. That is so true. You're not going to learn how to live in this life unless you really understand God's word. God has given us his word, and guess what? His word is without error. See, we live during a time when people talk about, I'm trying to find my own truth. Your truth pales in comparison with God has called you <coughs> to be and to do. It's God's way or no way at all. So God has given us his word that's infallible, and it's also inspired. Not only that, it is eternal. It is food for the soul. That's real soul food. And when we read the Bible, we're exposed to the very mind of God, so says scripture. Uh, so a good translation of that particular verse would be this. Because of this, stop being ignorant, but completely and thoroughly understand the will, the purpose, the policy, the design of the Lord. That's what that verse is saying. And God calls us uh, attention to his word. Let me tell you something about receiving God's word. Somebody shared this with me many years ago. Anytime you learn a point of doctrine, you will be tested in that area. What I have shared with you recently, you're going to be tested on today. So you need to stay alert. 
when God is calling you to be wise in an unwise situation. Because people are concerned. God is concerned about how you walk before the world. So as I close, we need to ponder some things here. God only wants what's best for us. The question is, do we want what God wants for us? And knowing the Bible is what keeps us settled. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, No foundation can any man lay other than that which is Christ Jesus. Whatever you're standing on, if it's not God's word, it's not going to hold you. You're standing on a leaning tower. Tower of Pisa, they call it. It was, it was built in a in sandy, marshy area. That's why it leans over like that. People go over uh, to Europe just to look at it. We're leaning, and we think we're standing erect. So you don't have to live like the world around you. Your life can count, and you can leave a legacy that counts uh, behind uh, to this world and to your children and to generations that will follow. You don't have to be spiritually deceived and ignorant of who Satan is and, and his schemes. But we can walk in wisdom if you follow the clear guidelines given to you from the word of God. He wants what's best for you. There should be nothing you want outside of God's will, and there should be nothing you're afraid of inside of God's will. And that's what enables you to walk with wisdom. So God says, take heed. If we will, simply take his word. And make it as a rudder for our lives on this journey that God has set us in. We will live out a life that honors God and become vessels of honor. So I, I leave you with two questions. Uh, how is your walk with the Lord? Really, how is your walk with the Lord? Are you walking in wisdom or are you walking in ignorance? Uh, how is your relationship with the Lord? Do you read God's word? Because you have to go from the written word Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we come before you once again with bowed heads and open hearts. Yes. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your peace you. in each and every one of our lives. We thank you for instructing us by means of your word how we ought to walk before the world. If there's one here today that doesn't realize it all begins at the cross, let them know you've made provision through your son. Because there's a problem, there's a penalty, and there's a provision. The problem is that we're all born in sin. Our message has filled the rags before you. Uh, Father God, you say the penalty is that we're separated from you because of that. But thank God for your provision, your son Jesus Christ. God has demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, your son Jesus Christ died for us. Make it real to him right now so they can be entered into your kingdom. In the sweet and strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen church, amen. and amen. We pray that you were blessed by that. And we pray that we will heed God's word. Because God always wants what's best for us. He said in 2 Peter 3, 9, God says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all men might come to repentance. To change our mind about who Jesus is as the Son of God and the work he did for us on the cross. This is the time to make yourself available to God. At this point in time, we're going to open up the doors of the church. If there's one here today that would like to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, God is waiting for you right now. And we can go back and Sing an old 100 as we wait. Oh, you got something? Okay. I'm going to ask Elder Mars to lead us an invitational song. And the doors of the church are open right now. Whosoever will, let them come. Sing this with me, just as I am. Just as.